Good afternoon. And it's a pleasure to have you in God's house here at St. Peter's on this final midweek Lenten service. Our theme will focus on a person of the passion, and today that person is one of the mob. And so we'll see that from our guest preacher, Pastor Zahn, today. We'll use the order of service of evening prayer or vespers. That's on page 215, 215 in the, in the hymnal. 215, please note that at the bottom of 215, we then go immediately to 216, singing the hymn of light on the very top of page 216. We begin on page 215, please stand. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Be our light and scatter the darkness, and hear our evening prayer and praise. Gladdening light of your rest, glory, shining down from heaven on high, from the ever-living Father, hail most blessed Jesus Christ. In the fading light of evening, as the setting sun Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation. We, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated, page 217. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Oh Lord, I call to you, come to my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let the incense of our prayers rise before you, O Lord, and let your mercy descend on us that we may sing your praises with the church on earth and forever in heaven, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We turn to page 51. Psalm 51, be merciful, O Lord. The congregation's invited to sing the refrains. The soloists will sing the verses and do remember that we will omit that last section, the glory be to the Father, and go right to the final refrain. Psalm 51. See on 
against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Be merciful, O Lord, for we Lord, we confess our sins to you and plead for your mercy. We acknowledge that sin runs too deep in our nature for us ever to rid ourselves of it, but we thank you that Jesus has done what we could not do, washing us clean of every stain. We plead that your spirit would give us the strength to live a new life through Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, the handbells will sing the anthem, will play the anthem. We pay close attention to the final reading of the passion history of our Lord Jesus Christ, of his death and burial. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among themselves and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. 
In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Here is your son. And to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put a sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his life. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies that you may also have faith. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled, that one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look upon the one they have pierced. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jews, going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph took the body. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, Joseph's own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock 
in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there and rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was alive, that imposter said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hymn 424, the soloist will sing the first two stanzas of hymn 424, the first two stanzas. Bye. 
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for meditation and consideration on this last midweek Lenten service is recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, beginning with verse 20. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to have Jesus put to death. The governor asked them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? Barabbas, they said. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, crucify him. But the governor said, why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting even louder, crucify him. This is the word of our Lord. My dear Christian friends, fellow redeemed, fellow Lenten worshipers and believers, you probably heard about and know the expression mob mentality, don't you? One moment, a crowd is cheering on its team, the next moment it's booing. One moment you have a milling crowd of people walking around and the next moment a frenzied crowd. People in a crowd often act in a way that they would not act if they were all alone. They instead become one of the mob following the impulse of the moment. It's that sort of mob spirit which sees the crowd that day at Jesus' trial. And so, as we continue on with our Lenten meditations of people of the Passion, this afternoon we want to look more closely at how it must have been at Jesus' passion for one of the mob, the follower. So what was this mob, this crowd that had gathered for Jesus' trial? When the chief priests and Pharisees planned Jesus' trial, they did not want a large crowd of people there. In fact, Matthew records in the chapter before our text these words. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. They plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. Now Jesus' followers came mostly from the common people who lived in and around Jerusalem and Judea, and if they should become aroused to defend Jesus, the Jewish leaders thought that their plan would fail. It would all cave in under popular pressure. These Jew Jewish leaders could not count on or depend on this crowd of people to side with them, and so it would be better in their thinking to do away with Jesus as quickly, silently, and secretly as possible. However, when Pontius Pilate delayed the proceedings of that trial of Jesus on that early Good Friday morning, a crowd still gathered and became a force in determining the outcome of that trial. Now, some came just to see the spectacle of this Jesus standing there on trial. Others came to see which prisoner would be released, as was the custom that was done on that day of the feast. Yet most of them ended up shouting in a frenzy for Jesus' blood, the opposite of what we might think they would have done. The priests and the elders 
quickly moved in, assessing the situation to control the crowd. Mark's gospel says this, but the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. So you can almost see them filtering through the crowd of people, spreading propaganda, trying to get people to go against Jesus. They agitated and they persuaded. They shouted loudly against Pilate and against Jesus at every opportunity they could so as to drown out any opposing voices and inspire the crowd to pick up the shout to condemn Jesus. And the result, dear friends, the mob turned against Jesus. And the crucial test came when Jesus and the notorious Barabbas were paired together for the people to choose which one to set free. And the Jewish leaders had done their work well. When Pilate asked which prisoner should be released, Jesus or Barabbas, an instantaneous cry went up. One of the Gospels recorded this way. Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us. Or as our text says, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. And then when Pilate protested Jesus' innocence, they shouted the more intensely. Crucify him. Let him be crucified. And then when Pilate took Jesus back into the praetorium, where he was beaten and mocked by the soldiers, and then again brought him out and presented him as innocent, the mob cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! If there were any dissenting voices in that mob, they were not heard or they were quickly hushed up by the wild-eyed mob. Now why? Why did they turn like that against Jesus? Why, why did the lips of some of those who just earlier in the week had shouted Hosanna to him now cry out, crucify him? Why did the lips of some of those who had seen Jesus perform miracles, now join in a chant against him. Why did the mood of the crowd become so violently hostile? We can only say that a cruel, evil, sinful mob mentality had grabbed them. Indeed, we don't know what was going on in the mind, in the thinking of every person there. But we can imagine how it was for one or another of that crowd, in that charged atmosphere of the proceedings, how, how he would get caught up and then swept along with the mood of the others. Now, dear friends, Picture yourselves there. You have been a follower of Jesus for some time, but you have never given up that popular expectation, as many people did, that this promised Messiah, Jesus, would be a bread king, an earthly ruler. You and your friends have looked for the Messiah to lead your country back to the grandeur of what Israel once was, especially in the days of King David and King Solomon. You had placed your hopes on this Jesus, and now this is taking place? Still picture yourself there, dear friends. Now you and I arrive at Pilate's court on that fateful Friday. You and I see Jesus standing there, Beaten, bloodied, meek, silent. Giving up, seemingly, without a fight. 
You can hardly believe that. He's that same man you cheered on when he entered Jerusalem just a couple of days ago. So you turn to the person next to you in the crowd, someone who's probably been there for a while, and you ask, so what's going on here? What does this all mean? And that person of the mob next to you says that Jesus blasphemed against God and that the priests and religious leaders have warned that he is a danger to the people and the nation. But we thought he would lead us to better days, you say. And what has he done for the nation? That man in the crowd next to you challenges your thinking at that point. And then he says that the chief priests and, and leaders will <coughs> say that Jesus, if he is not stopped, he will lead us into trouble with the Romans. The Roman government, they'll increase our taxes. The Roman government will disband the Jewish council, taking away more and more power from us in our own land. And yes, even saying that they will force us to, to worship the Roman emperor. So, you and I, still in this situation, standing there, you and I are confused. You, you think back about some of the many miracles that Jesus had performed and the many, many people he had helped in the past. Even the fact that he raised the people from the dead. But more mob pressure is applied. The man next to you, again, picturing yourself in this situation, counters by saying that, nah, Jesus, Jesus is a troublemaker. He even says that Barabbas is better than Jesus because Barabbas, being an insurrectionist, at least wanted to rid the nation of Roman tyranny. And it is just at that time, as our text points out, that Pilate appears with Barabbas and Jesus and asks which one he should release. Give us Barabbas, that man next to you shouts, crucify Jesus, away with him. The man repeats, crucify him. Again, still picturing ourselves there, you see Pilate gesturing in defense of Jesus. Our text states, they all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And so you're thinking, but if Jesus were the real Messiah, he wouldn't be made helpless under the pressure of the thumb of this Pontius Pilate, this Roman governor. In fact, it seems that Pilate's the only one who doubts what to do in this situation. And he, Pontius Pilate, is your enemy. So your doubts are all confirmed. Jesus must go. The cry goes up again, crucify him. And now you join in. Crucify him. You join in. Convinced that you were wrong to ever have followed this pitiable wretch of a man standing there on trial. He's no king. He's no Messiah. Crucify him. And what's happened, dear friends? You and I have become one of the mob. See, Jesus has no fight in him, so why should you speak up for him? You cheer when the final verdict is given and delivered, and then you follow along with the crowd out to see and witness the crucifixion. So, one of the mob, the follower, what happens to you afterward? 
Maybe you are standing in earshot of the cross and you hear Jesus speak to those words, Father, forgive them, and that turns you to re-examine your actions. Or the darkness and the earthquake at Jesus' death shock you into realizing just how terribly wrong you were. Or just maybe you're there a little later on in Jerusalem in another crowd on the day of Pentecost and, and you hear the Apostle Peter and the other disciples tell about Jesus' glorious resurrection from the dead and you are brought to repentance and are baptized. Or just maybe you go to your grave believing that justice was served and that the people and the nation were better off with Jesus being destroyed. As one of the mob, you have followed blindly. You have switched allegiances arbitrarily. You will only be led straight again by the light, the light of the truth, the truth of the gospel of a crucified and risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Indeed, it was sad how the evil of that crowd on that day just compounded itself. The devil worked his worst. Nevertheless, Jesus came out the conqueror, the victor in the end. For by his suffering and death and resurrection, he conquered sin, death, and the power of the devil. Now we, we human beings today have not changed appreciably since then, however. You and I still succumb to and give in to the pressures of mob action. We still listen to rationalizations being spoken all around us by the people of society. Rationalizations about this or about that, about politics, about religion. We listen to rationalizations instead of listening to God's word. Everybody's doing it, right? That, that's, that's still our favorite excuse for sinning. Group pressures still affect us. Like when we're in a crowd that is bent on saying or doing something contrary to the word and the way of Christ. It's no easy thing to stand there and be on the side of Jesus. Instead, it's easier for us to just join in and follow the crowd. Another example might be noted in the religious scene in America today, where there is this frantic push for one super church to belong to, and letting go of Jesus, if possible, uh, to achieve that. Oh, the rationale for that church, the appeal to its numbers and its money and its unity are all very impressive. And, and all you have to do is ignore this or that, some parts of God's word to achieve it. Even some church leaders are telling you today that absolute trust in Christ, trust in his absolute word of truth, that's not necessary. And if you speak against that, if you voice opposition to that, there are many, many in the crowd to drown out your voice. So, where does that leave us, dear friends? We need one another. Not as a mob with its mentality, but as a group of individual believers who are growing together in love and faith by the gospel of Jesus. We need to come together often to remember our Savior Jesus Christ through 
word and sacraments and to glorify his name for his sacrifice on the cross. We need to listen to Jesus and to avoid any kind of mob appeal that contradicts him. And we need also to hold to our Savior in his mercy and forgiveness for all those times that we have failed to truly follow him. So let us remember the crucifixion and resurrection of our Savior. Let us rally, rally around the cross and his empty tomb. Yes, let us tell the world that even those who in weakness or in ignorance are still shouting in their hearts or with their lies are still shouting, crucify him. Let us tell them that they will find forgiveness and salvation in Jesus' death and resurrection by the grace of God. And then too, let us all live in true repentance and faith, rejoicing to be counted in as children, not, not as a mob of following a path of darkness and unbelief, but being counted in as children of the family of God. Members of the church militant here on earth right now by faith, patiently awaiting our entrance into the church triumphant, joining in the crowd of saints and angels, all true believers in the glory of heaven, and all because of that crucifixion, that death, and that resurrection of our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God grant that to us for Jesus' sake. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Join to sing the song of Mary on pages 218 and 219. Please stand. Yes. 
Please be seated. Our rich and generous offerings to the Lord are presented at the altar. middle of page 223. Page 223. Please stand. Let us pray. Abide with us, Lord, for it is evening and the day is almost over. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us in the evening of the day, in the evening of life in the evening of the world. Abide with us in your grace and goodness, in your holy word and sacrament, in your comfort and blessing. Abide with us when we are overcome by the night of sorrow and fear, by the night of doubt and affliction, by the night of bitter death. Abide with us and with all your people in time and in eternity. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. We sing him 794, 794.
warm welcome to all of you here this afternoon. As this series of midweek Lenten services comes to an end, don't forget, of course, the special services coming up. Palm Sunday, Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and of course, Easter as well. Speaking of Easter, the Easter breakfast could use uh, some more of your generosity with the Easter breakfast preparation, so please check out the information there on the information station. And if you're able to come and help out for about an hour and a half on Easter, on, I should say, this coming Saturday uh, to hang up Easter door hangers, there is information there on the information station as well. That's this coming Saturday morning. Have a pleasant evening. God bless you all. Thank you to our guest preacher, Pastor Zahn, for his message of faith and reconciliation that we have, even though we often are caught up as the mob, that Jesus has saved every single one of us. Praise be to Christ. Thank you, Pastor.